is Chris Guthrie. I'm a professor of law and the dean of Vanderbilt Law School. On behalf of the law school, I'm delighted to welcome you to this lecture, which is co-sponsored by the Environmental Law and Policy Annual Review, or LPAR, the Environmental Law Program, and our Environmental Law Society. Uh, this lecture gives me an opportunity to celebrate the law school's partnership with the Environmental Law Institute, or ELI, which has resulted not only in LPAR, uh, but also in student externships and a variety of academic programs. It also gives me an opportunity to recognize Linda Bregan and Mike Vandenberg, two law school faculty members who have worked tirelessly to build this partnership. And finally, it allows me to welcome publicly to the law school Professor J.B. Rule, who is now working with Professors Vandenberg and Bregan and our student leaders uh, to enhance our already outstanding environmental law program. Uh, it's my honor today to introduce our speaker, John Cruden, who was recently named the fourth president of ELI, a graduate of West Point, Santa Clara University Law School, and the University of Virginia Law School, John is a decorated veteran. Among many, many other awards, he has received the Bronze Star and the Legion of Merit. He is a leading environmental lawyer. For more than a decade and a half, he served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the Department of Justice. He is a devoted public servant he has received the Presidential Rank Award three times, served as the President of the District of Columbia Bar, and chaired the ABA Section of Environment, Energy, and Resources. And in an era that unfortunately is characterized by extreme partisanship, he is well known for the principled and pragmatic way he works with multiple and varied constituencies to reach consensus on tough issues. Will you please join me in welcoming him to Vanderbilt and to Nashville? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a treat. What a treat for me to be here and to see you and to see friends of uh, 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 mine. I, I, I knew J.B. Rule when he was at the professor at Florida State uh, and a great one uh, uh, there. I'm really honored by the fact that uh, uh, Bob Martinow is here, who is the commissioner of the Tennessee Environment and Conservation, who just told me he has 3,000 employees and, more importantly, four golf courses uh, <laughs> under his uh, responsibility, which challenges every one of us. But I'm so pleased that all of you uh, 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 could be here. Uh, as we talk, as I'm going to talk a bit about uh, uh, Supreme Court practice. That's what I'm really trying to center you on. And, and in order to do that, I'm going to talk about a few cases from the last term that were decided. So those are uh, things that were already completed. Uh, and then a few cases now that are on the term uh, uh, coming up. It's a rather interesting time right now as we look at the Supreme Court. We have two relatively new justices, Sotomayor and Elena Kagan, uh, who are in fact developing their own jurisprudence. Sotomayor you can kind of figure out because of course she was on the Second Circuit for a long time. She has a whole body of cases. Not so true with Elena Kagan. You're really looking at just what happened over the course of uh, 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 last year. Before I start though, I want to introduce what, one more player in all of this process uh, for you, because you'll see I'm, I make references to it as I go over there. Right now, that player is Donald Varelli. Who is, this is audience participation time, who is audience Donald Varelli? The 10th Justice. Solicitor General. Solicitor General of the United States. There was a book written, you know, about him being, or not, Don Varelli in particular. Don Varelli was a partner in a law firm uh, and then came to the Department of Justice in the deputy's office and then went to be the deputy White House uh, uh, counsel and out of that position was picked by the president to be the Solicitor General of the United States. On the chart of the Department of Justice that shows that an individual is like the third ranking person or fourth ranking person, don't believe it. Uh, the Solicitor General calls the shots on Supreme Court decisions and what's overlooked very often is he also calls the shot on any case that's going to be appealed out of the Department of Justice. Any case has to go up he has to agree, and that's how you get uniformity. So when the Solicitor General asks that a case be granted certiorari, which requires four votes in the nine Supreme Court justices, or opposes it, it has more significance uh, uh, than others. And what happens when they leave? You'll see. 
Uh, I will show you what happens to former solicitor generals uh, sometime. But anyway, keep that thought uh, as we progress uh, uh, here. Clearly, you know, there's lots of decisions, and, and you know, probably health care is going to dominate this Supreme Court uh, 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 term. I'm talking exclusively about environmental uh, uh, decisions. That's where I am. That's my background. Uh, and so let's see if this works. Uh, uh, and so that's what I'm focusing on. And I'm going to focus on two again, uh, uh, because there's really only two important ones coming out of the last uh, uh, term, and then we'll talk about two again uh, 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 coming up. So without question, AEP is the leading case that came out of the last term. It's the one that caught all of the attention. It is the climate change case, uh, uh, and the only climate change case that's come to Supreme Court since uh, the 2007 decision in Massachusetts versus EPA, and it got lots of attention uh, 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 coming up. And it has a rather interesting history. Uh, this is the case where eight states, including New York, three or four land trusts and other organization sue five groups, including, by the way, Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, uh, on greenhouse gas issues. And they want, uh, they say, this violates common law. Now, no statutes. This violates common law. What do you want? Very important. What do you want, uh, you states and organizations? We want two things. We want you to cap the emissions of carbon dioxide. And then every year, we want you to reduce the emissions uh, of these five emitters, which probably, you know, they're probably 75%, certainly in the utility area of carbon dioxide from these five plants. So that's what they do. And they file their suit uh, uh, in, or as a petition, and then a later suit, in 2004. Uh, in 2004, there is nothing. There's no statutes. There is no you know, EPA endangerment finding, there's no regulations, there's nothing. Uh, and the case kind of perks along. It gets dismissed at the district court uh, uh, level on political question uh, issues, basically saying Congress ought to do this, not the judiciary. That's what happens to district court. It goes up to the Second Circuit, uh, uh, and it is argued before three Second Circuit judges, one of which is Sotomayor. Um, but there's no opinion uh, in that case for quite a while. Uh, in the meantime, the Supreme Court decides Massachusetts versus EPA in 2007. Uh, um, EPA still hasn't done anything really regulatory-wise, but in 2009 now uh, is when the Second Circuit uh, uh, reverses the district court and says there is standing uh, and there is a way to go forward on this case. We're not bound by a political question. There's no real way that we cannot and, and orders the case to go forward. That's the case that goes to the Supreme Court, uh, which gets decided last year. But, but the history is actually important in all of that. So here is what happens to at least, you know, you'll see now the first of the, uh, uh, what happens to these guy pictures uh, out there, you know, like in your yearbook or something. So this is a Supreme Court takes her shawari, they grant it, uh, uh, Sonia Moore all automatically recuses herself from the case. So what does that mean? There's eight justices now. Uh, uh, you can kind of figure out the mix that was in Massachusetts versus EPA. What happens if they, if they split 4-4 on anything now? Tie vote, tie vote. The, whatever happened to lower coat stands, all right? And that's happened. It's happened any number of times. So you're already starting with the premise, which becomes relevant in the decision, that there could be a, a, a tie vote here. And if so, the Second Circuit decision uh, uh, stands. Um, but anyway, if you look over uh, here, Peter Keisler, Neil Katchel, Peter Keisler uh, had been uh, the Associate Attorney General of the Department of Justice for a brief period of time, like about a week. He was actually acting uh, uh, Attorney General uh, during the Bush administration. Uh, when Elena Kagan left to be the, uh, she was Solicitor General of the United States, uh, but when she left to go to the Supreme Court, Neil was her deputy. Neil now is, in fact, the acting uh, uh, Solicitor General, and these two have two parts of the case. Uh, Peter's going to argue uh, for the power plants. Neil is going to argue for the government. The government is TVA. TVA is the government because TVA is, is in fact, uh, a federal agency. But, the, but TVA represented itself before the Second Circuit. There was no involvement by the Department of Justice in what happened in the Second Circuit. So now what is going to be filed by Neil before the Supreme Court is actually new to TVA. And the position that they ultimately took is not the same position 
uh, that TVA took before the Second Circuit. And that's the dividing line on TVA. TVA gets to represent itself more or less uh, at district court and court of appeals level, but when they go to Supreme Court, only the Solicitor General will speak for the United States, and so they have to accept whatever ultimately happens there. Anyway, these are the two protagonists. There's actually one more, uh, and we'll get to her in a minute. Uh, and so up in the right-hand corner is Justice Ginsburg. She ultimately decides uh, 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 the case. She is the one who I will show you later also asks one of the very first questions. In a minute, I'll tell you the importance of that. But let's go over just for a second uh, uh, what happened. Uh, 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 in the case. Now remember, there's a whole body, extreme body of procedural issues that are out there. The major one being standing, just like it was in Massachusetts versus EPA, without standing, the court is dismissed. Rightness is the issue. Is this the appropriate time for the court uh, uh, to consider it? Uh, when it was discussed in the Second Circuit, it was Article Three standing, but the Department of Justice adds prudential standing. They call it a combined political question issues and rightness all together and they say prudential standing is another thing that you should be uh, considering. All of these, in addition to is there a federal common law, are all present uh, uh, right now, all in the uh, argument that's uh, uh, going forward. And now Ginsburg writes for a court uh, that is eight justices strong. And, as it shows here uh, in the red, on these jurisdictional issues, political question, rightness, standing, they split 4-4. Four, four. They doesn't actually say which four justices are. There's only one paragraph of the entire opinion that talks about this. But you can kind of figure it out from Massachusetts versus EPA uh, 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 who they are. I mean, obviously, Ginsburg is one of the four. And we would have to say that Elena Kagan and Breyer uh, uh, are, are the other you know, uh, sorts of justices. And you can kind of figure out that the other four uh, would be, you know, obviously, Scalia, Thomas, uh, uh, Alito, that group are there. So they split 4-4 four, four on the procedural issues. But when they get to the second substantive issue, which I'll get to in a second, there it's 8-0, uh, with an interesting concurring opinion. So the part that is most important uh, is in the second one, uh, which is, you know, how do they actually handle this issue of a federal common law, given the fact that since all that decision, now EPA has done things. EPA has put out regulations. EPA has done very controversial things now in greenhouse gas issues, which, by the way, as a side, has nothing to do with the Supreme Court, uh, are also getting challenged, and now there's a date uh, in February that those, these other EPA rules will get argued before the D.C. Circuit. Um, but for the purposes of the opinion, which was decided this year, all you need to know is that EPA had done a lot of things pursuant to the Clean Air Act. And what Ginsburg, writing for everybody, says is that displaces the common law. It absolutely displaces it. It doesn't preempt it, really. It means that it has filled the void. There isn't much left over. But also, here is, in this part right here, this is where they're discussing federal common law. My wife is not here, but I will tell you a story because it's sort of how Ginsburg wrote the opinion. My wife writing, giving you directions somewhere. Uh, um, we live in Northern Virginia. Sharon says, if you want to go to the school, here's what you do. You, you drive down this right and you'll see the, you know, you'll see Walmart on your left. It's not that. Keep going straight. Uh, uh, go straight now for about another two miles and there's a big Shell gas station. It's not there either. Uh, uh, and then you go about a mile and you'll turn right at the, uh, uh, the intersection. So she gives you all these guideposts. Sort of, that's what Ginsburg did here. What you're, this is not the opinion. This is just extracts of the opinion. In between this line and this line, there's like two or three pages talking about eerie decisions, whether or not there's a federal common law, talking about Judge Friendly's views about the new federal common law, talking about where environmental actions fit into the new federal common law. Quite interesting. And then she says, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's been displaced. You know, it's, it's the Walmart, but don't go there. Uh, you don't have to, just keep going uh, 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 straight. So the central part of all the entire decision uh, is in fact uh, uh, the displacement issue. That is what they're uh, uh, there. Now, oral argument. It used to be when uh, 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 Sandra Day O'Connor was a Supreme Court justice, she had a habit of asking, 
really the first question in any Supreme Court argument. And we all waited. You know, I mean, I was there for the AEP argument, but you kind of waited to see because very often O'Connor was a swing vote. Uh, and so that question that she asked, because very often it was very pointed, you could kind of figure out what was going to happen at the end of the argument. Justice Kennedy, who's the swing vote today, doesn't do that. It's really unfortunate because now we all have to guess and make up these things, you know. Uh, and by the way, almost all television commentators after a Supreme Court argument are clueless because most of the time we can't figure out what's going to happen. Those of us were involved. But this was different, way different, because we had the, you know, sort of daughter of Sandra Day O'Connor asking the very first question, and look what it says, you know, it says, God, the thing that you're asking them to do that kind of feels like you're turning them into EPA. Because remember what I was, remember I told you what the, what, the, what the states wanted them to do? Set emission limits. You, you court set the lim emission limits and then bring them down every year. That's what they were being asked to do. And Ginsburg asking the first question. Uh, 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 by the way, all of us sitting in the audience at that time thought, okay, show's over. Uh, the only question now is how, how you lose. There is not a question about whether or not you lose because there's no way uh, that the states could have prevailed without having Ginsburg on their side. But here's other questions that were asked during uh, uh, argument, which are kind of interesting. Uh, Breyer says, can the court set a tax? Because remember, one of, the, one of the solutions to carbon uh, 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 stuff is a carbon tax. That would be one of the solutions. It's clearly a legislative option. Barbara Underwood, who's the third person in that trilogy. I told you about Peter Kostler. I told you about Neil Katchel. But Barbara Underwood is the Solicitor General of the state of New York, and she's arguing for all the states. But by the way, Barbara had also been in the Solicitor General's office in the United States. So all these people know each other. All of them, and they're all friends. They're all talking. They're all the people who are arguing. They have this connection through the Solicitor General's uh, office. But Barbara says, I don't think so. Well, if the court can't do all the things that the legislature can do, uh, then that actually raises issues about whether or not the court is the proper place uh, to do that. And then you have Scalia, who's actually talking not only about uh, uh, the questions uh, of what sort of relief, he's also still talking to you about standing. So both of these things, one of them, of course, isn't a question at all. It's, it's really an, an open question about if you displace, whatever that means, if you displace uh, 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 the federal common law, what that leaves in place of is, of course, state common law. And at the end of the decision, uh, uh, Ginsburg says we're not reaching that issue because that wasn't decided by the Second Circuit. Uh, and so he is saying, I don't know if that's a good idea uh, or not. I think I'd rather have federal courts uh, uh, decided. Uh, and then later on goes on and he makes his cow case, which I put there just because I thought it was funny. Uh, uh, there. All right, so AEP. <laughs> Uh, was without question the leading uh, uh, and most important environmental uh, uh, case, and I did everything if, with you except one thing. I did not tell you about the concurring decision. There, now, it's an 8-0 decision. Remember, it's 4-4 on the procedural issue, so that means you uphold the Second Circuit, which means you can decide the case, which means they're standing, uh, which means that Justice Kennedy, who was the deciding vote in Massachusetts versus EPA, has not changed his mind about standing. So that's not unimportant. It's actually quite important. Uh, about that. But 4-4, four, four, so you all pulled the Second Circuit, and 8-0, eight, 8-0. Eight, Every justice uh, uh, decides uh, that the EPA regulations have displaced uh, 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 the Clean Air Act. Uh, so that's important. Uh, so what's left? And the concurring opinion. The concurring opinion by Thomas and, Cleto, uh, and Alito is only a few sentences long, and it says, we concur, assuming that, you know, Massachusetts ver versus EPA is still good law. That's interesting. I mean, you don't need to do that. Of course, you're assuming that Massachusetts versus EPA, but it's obviously a marker uh, that they didn't like Massachusetts uh, uh, versus EPA. What's left? What's left in the case? Well, I told you that the court did not decide the state issue. None of us think that the state issue has any traction. You know, see Scalia's uh, argument. But one other, one other area, and that is uh, clearly right now in Congress, uh, there's various proposals that would stop EPA or prevent EPA from taking action on their greenhouse gas regulations. If any of those passed, then you have eliminated the entire basis for the decision, 
and, and, and most of us believe it springs back up then. Then the whole question of federal common law springs back up because then there would be no displacement because there would be no statutory authority. So none of that's happened, but there are still issues uh, uh, that are there. All right, so that was one. That is greenhouse gas uh, issues, and we're about to switch to the other uh, decision. Most of you who have been following the Supreme Court clearly were aware of AEP because it got a lot of attention, not so aware uh, of the lawsuit by uh, uh, Montana. But look what it is. This is Montana versus Wyoming. Montana sued Wyoming. It says it's on exceptions to a report of a special master. And look at the citation, number 137, and that's original. So what does original mean? It means under the Constitution, if a state sues another state, original jurisdiction in the Supreme Court. So it goes nonstop. There is no lower court. There's no district court opinion. There's no court of appeals decision. These, this is an argument by Montana that there's something bad that Wyoming has done to me, and I'll describe what that is in a second. But I will tell you these original jurisdiction cases are disproportionately water rights. The, the, the arguments about one state over another Many, many, many of them have to do with appropriation and water as it was true in this case. All of them, all of them do not get handled initially by the judges. They have a special master, just like they have in this case. Uh, special master means sometimes a judge, sometimes a practitioner, hears the parties out, kind of conducts fact-finding and writes lengthy opinions, uh, then that goes to the Supreme Court. And that is what then gets argued about as it was here. So the argument here is, this is a map that shows you uh, the Yellowstone River. You can see up in the upper left-hand corner where it's starting in uh, uh, Wyoming, uh, and then, or excuse me, in Montana, moving to uh, uh, Wyoming. Uh, if you look up there, you can see Glacier National Park. Glacier National Park with lots of glaciers actually helps feed these waters. So there's a lot of up and down to the water. In about 1949 or 1950, the two states come together and have a compact. Uh, compacts, ha compacts have to be legislatively blessed uh, between the states, but in fact it allocated water and it allowed a certain amount of water to be used upstream and then of course downstream, uh, which is what you're seeing there out of Montana, uh, uh, they get left. And what Montana is saying is we're getting less water. Wyoming is using more water uh, uh, than they should. Uh, uh, and therefore, we are suing them because they're not fulfilling the contract. That's the whole of the case, is the state, downstream state, saying, I'm getting less water. Uh, uh, the opinion is written by uh, Justice Thomas. It's an 8-1 decision. Thomas then cites here what, what's really happening uh, because the state of Wyoming says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's what's really happening. Back in 1949, 1950, what would happen is we would actually take this water for agricultural use and we just flooded it. We just flooded the farm uh, uh, and then when that water was done, it ran off back into the Yellowstone River. So you were actually, the quantity of river you, water you were getting was really some through that, but some of that was runoff. And, and we're more efficient now. Instead of using just flooding, we're using sprinklers. Uh, and the sprinklers have a lot less runoff. So it isn't like we're taking more water than we did before. All that's happening is we are being more efficient uh, uh, than we were before, and, and, that, and that's why you're getting, and they agree, they agree uh, that downstream is, state is getting less. So here's Thomas saying, here's what the case is. It arises out of the compact uh, uh, and ultimately decides in favor of the downstream state. But look at this. You know, you always have to look at footnotes here in the, um, uh, maybe we'll look at footnotes. Footnotes in these Supreme Court uh, decisions, uh, because very often those are the areas that really tell you uh, uh, what's happening. Look at footnote four. Footnote four says, uh, um, we, you know, we're going to look at state appropriation law. We're going to look at Western water law. Well, that's almost common law issues. So I've just talked to you about AEP issues and the concern about federal common law. Here they are essentially, Thomas essentially saying, we are going to be looking at uh, 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 Western water law. And then footnote five says, but we don't feel good about it. 
well, this, you know, <laughs> this consul's caution. Uh, uh, we're not quite sure what we're doing is right. Uh, and look at the last sentence. You know, most of the Supreme Court says, and we are the final arbiter. We are so close to God, it doesn't matter. Uh, and therefore, we, you know, you got to follow us. Here, they say, our decision is not intended to bind states. Uh, and so it is a whole nother area uh, of the law when you get into water law appropriations, which really are provided to the states, which really are, in fact, important there. Uh, and here's a case that does it. Now, once again, uh, uh, I want to point this out for two reasons. Uh, this is part of Thomas's opinion. Look about halfway down. Um, for those of you, like me, uh, that used nutshells when I was in law school. By the way, I still use nutshells uh, 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 right now. There's a good one on natural resource damages. Uh, lest you feel badly about that, uh, uh, which you should not, uh, uh, here is the Supreme Court citing to uh, the water law in a nutshell. Therefore, it can't be that bad uh, uh, to do that. But let me tell you one other thing. Uh, which is more sober, and I want you to think about this for a second. The author of this, David Getches, is, was the dean, uh, longtime dean in uh, uh, Colorado Law School in Boulder. Uh, he died uh, uh, this year. Great man, uh, great, uh, he, had, he had a whole history of Native American uh, representations that he did, which he was famous for. He was a, a great scholar in the area of water law. We all miss him, and so I wanted to also point that out. Uh, not only did we get a citation by him, which he probably didn't know, uh, but also we miss him. Scalia dissents uh, uh, from uh, all of this, and, and the dissent uh, is basically Scalia at his normals uh, uh, saying, well, in fact, uh, uh, if we read the strict wording, if you will, uh, of that compact, if you just take its literal meaning, uh, then we would not go in this direction. But that's not why I'm showing you this. I'm showing you this because he actually made up a word. Look at this. Uh, uh, so you've got to love the guy. You really do. Because uh, he says, well, I'm going to grant those Wyomans. Where do you get that from? Uh, and then in his, his little footnote there, he says, well, it should be Wyomingite, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make up a word. And if you're a Supreme Court justice, you can make up a word. Uh, you, know, you know, and he certainly did right there. Uh, I believe the people of Wyoming deserve better than uh, the dictionary uh, 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 issue. Um, so, come on, you look for humor wherever you find it in these things, sorts of things. All right, so those were the two major cases. One water right case. Uh, hold that thought because you're going to see some history coming back. And then second, uh, the AEP decision, which is still, again, extremely looked at, extremely cited. It's a very important decision. Now, clearly, I would say the most important decision coming up environmentally. By the way, overall, the most important decision, you know, is probably health care. But uh, the decision coming up environmentally is this one. This is the Sackett. Uh, a decision over in the upper right-hand corner are the Sacketts themselves. They own property in, you know, a residential housing area in Idaho. Uh, there it is over on the right-hand side, their home, and they're building it. It's about 0.6 acres. And it is uh, a story that goes something like this. Uh, uh, they want to build their home. Uh, uh, they start doing so. Uh, somehow it comes to the attention of the Environmental Protection Agency who believes it is in a wetland area. Uh, and so they give an administrative order. The administrative order says stop what you're doing, fix it back to where you are. But by the way, if you don't like, come and talk to us uh, 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 there. So that's the order. But the order clearly has monetary significance to it, potentially, which I'll get to, and clearly is a directive order to stop doing things uh, that are wetland oriented. Uh, all right, so most of you know, of course, the Clean Water Act in Section 404 gives, uh, uh, first of all, Corps of Engineers and EPA authority over uh, uh, soil and debris and things that are going into waters of the United States. That was the whole basis of the Rapanos decision in 2007. Uh, this is not Rapanos, although I'll get a connection in a second. This, in fact, case deals entirely, entirely with something called pre-enforcement review. That's the issue. Because when, when the Sackets were unable uh, to get uh, any uh, 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 help by EPA, they said. They requested a hearing by EPA, which they denied, uh, uh, having the hearing. They sued. 
the Sackett sue in court uh, in order to get pre-enforcement review. Why is it pre-enforcement? Because it has not yet, EPA did not take it into court themselves. They issued the order, no question the, sort, the order is not self-enforcing. It's not like you start paying money right away or anything like that. It has to be enforced. It was not enforced. Uh, 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 there. Uh, so when Sackett's brought it into the district court in Idaho, they were seeking pre-enforcement or review. And they lost at the district court because there's a long line of cases, a long line of cases that say in, in, in many of the media, certainly Superfund, uh, uh, certainly Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, that you don't get pre-enforcement review. You have to wait until EPA, or whoever the agency is, state agency, enforces it. Uh, so that's it. They took it to the Ninth Circuit uh, 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 there. They also lost at the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and so, by the way, uh, if those of you who are watching the Supreme Court know uh, that if you're going before the Ninth Circuit, you actually have to ask consciously, do I want to win or lose? <laughs> I am still convinced that somewhere in the Supreme Court there's like a Ninth Circuit box uh, uh, there that says, watch this. Um, because if you look over the years, uh, uh, there's so many, more, it's such a higher level of cases that have been taken out of the Ninth Circuit and then a, and a very high level of cases that have been reversed uh, out of the Ninth Circuit. But this goes to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit agrees with the district court. Uh, there is no circuit split. There's no circuit split. That's the normal way. That's the most important way the Supreme Court takes cases when there's a split, differences between circuits here, no circuit split. Uh, 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 there uh, when this thing uh, uh, comes up. Um, so, and the Solicitor General, who gets weight on this, uh, opposes Sir Roy. Why, again, does, this, does he oppose uh, Sir Roy? And it is a he in this case. Because there's no circuit split. There's no circuit split. This thing has been going on a long time. Uh, uh, and in fact, there is a way that you get judicial review, uh, and that is if there's an enforcement case. If there's an enforcement case, when it goes then, then just wait. If there's an enforcement case, you get tons of judicial uh, uh, review at that stage. And so this would be premature. You don't need to have it now. That's his basic uh, 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 argument. But here's the other arguments. Well, first of all, as I mentioned to you at the top, here's what an enforcement order does. It actually makes you do things, and it has a penalty outlay uh, uh, to it, which is not insignificant. Pacific Legal Foundation, who is representing uh, uh, the Sacketts, makes a number of arguments. Pacific Legal Foundation has been in a, in a lot of these wetland cases and takings cases. They're quite good. Uh, uh, they're, they're relying on a decision out of two, 1994 that says that you actually have to have due process in one of these pre-enforcement cases if, in fact, you really can't get meaningful review at some other stage. It's so coercive that, in fact, you have to do it, and therefore you don't get review. That's their argument, and there is some support by a clean air case called TVA versus Whitman. So that's their particular position. Again, the Solicitor General opposes all of that. Uh, uh, there. Now, what's underlying all of uh, 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 this? Um, you know, those of you who have followed, you know, the Rapanos decision, uh, uh, those of us who are in the wetland area think, well, you did such a good job on Rapanos uh, uh, that now you're going to help uh, by taking Sackett. Rapanos, of course, is the case uh, where the Supreme Court had such a divided level uh, of opinions that there was absolutely no majority. There is, in fact, a plurality of four persons. Justice Kennedy is in the middle. And we're still now going, there's still no uniformity in the United States uh, as to what that decision actually means. Uh, which test do you follow? What is the test that comes out? Most courts are, in fact, using what you see there in Justice Kennedy's uh, statement about, you know, using what is called the significant nexus, but he was the only justice that said that. You know, I know I'm not sure Quayle's statement is any worse uh, uh, than that. Uh, uh, but the Pacific Legal Foundation back into says, hey, look, it isn't really meaningful review. We're not really getting meaningful review because look at all the orders and there's not many of those that actually go to court. Uh, and therefore, that argument is, it's very coercive. We should be able to hear uh, 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 that case. But what surprised everybody is this one. What surprised everybody is before the Supreme Court decided to take this case, which is Clean Water Act pre-enforcement review, they did not take the case of General Electric's pre-enforcement review uh, argument. General Electric argued on the case of Superfund. 
you know, the Comprehensive Emergency Response Compensation Liability Act, which we all refer to as Superfund, uh, uh, in that case, uh, um, that had gone up through the D.C. Circuit, had, had gone up the D.C. Circuit twice, the key issue was, in a, in a CERCLA administrative order, can you get pre-enforcement review, uh, and, the, uh, and Judge John Bates in the D.C., uh, and then later the D.C. Circuit said, no, you don't get it. That case goes up, uh, uh, and CERT is denied only about a month before this case uh, 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 gets decided. So what's happening? What's happening to the Supreme Court? If we're going to take one, why wouldn't you take the GE uh, 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 case? General thinking is, in fact, uh, 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 this, and that is just a different statute. Uh, and the statutory language of Superfund re really supports better. Uh, that there is no pre-enforcement review. Even the Ninth Circuit says, I have to imply that there's no enforcement review. Uh, I can't really find it explicitly like you can uh, in Superfund. But one other part that's just fascinating for those of us who follow the Supreme Court, and that is what Pacific Legal Foundation asked the court to consider was whether or not there was a violation of due process. So you don't get a hearing. You don't get a chance to have your voice heard in any tribunal or in any hearing. Remember, I told you they asked for an administrative hearing and didn't get it. That was the question that they asked. The Supreme Court, when they granted cert, said, we don't want to hear that question. We want to know whether or not it violates the Administrative Procedure Act. That's the question that they're asking. Most of us think that's probably Justice Scalia. Scalia, who would be sympathetic to the argument, but not sympathetic to expanding due process rights. He's spoken largely on that in, in any number of cases. And so he would bring this way more into a statutory issue, which means it's governed by the Administrative Procedure Act. By the way, we're just guessing. Uh, so what can the Supreme Court do on all that? A lot of options. The court could do as improvidently granted. That means I wish I hadn't voted for it. Four justices have to vote for it. And they say, well, we made a mistake. Not going to happen in this case. Will not. The second one, they could affirm this, uh, the uh, Ninth Circuit. Not impossible. Uh, um, not impossible, unlikely, uh, but if it is, it's about Justice Kennedy. So if you're watching this argument, which has not been scheduled yet, so it probably means it's in January, late January time frame, watch carefully what the, the questions that Kennedy asked, because you can kind of figure out the other people already uh, on uh, there. So it may well be that we you know what he thinks about all this uh, 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 turns it. They can clearly say uh, that, you know, we just reverse saying there has to be pre-enforcement review. Then the question is, on what basis? Is it based narrowly on the statute of the Clean Water Act or is it broader and, and affects other arguments. Those of you who know something about the Rapanos decision know how difficult it is and to in fact figure out waters in the United States because in fact the law is so murky in that particular area. So if every one of those decisions, every one of those pronouncements uh, uh, went to the court, it would be a huge uh, 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 idea. And this, and this is just uh, Scalia's uh, point on thunder, whether or not that one provides a basis for overturning uh, all of that. So it's, again, it's a very big uh, decision coming up, quite interesting uh, there. And there's a whole issue of whether or not it affects narrowly, narrowly means Clean Water Act, or broadly, uh, of where it affects virtually all of the environmental statutes. So I did one Montana case for you. Let me do a second. Uh, Montana's been busy. Uh, 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 there, but this was not a case uh, by which there was, in fact, original jurisdiction, uh, because in this case, uh, uh, Montana uh, uh, sued a utility. Uh, it turns out uh, that Montana wants money uh, from the utility. They want money for renting uh, uh, the bottoms of the water uh, by which these Comp this company has its dams, which are creating, which are power sources uh, uh, for them. Um, and so now we have two former solicitor generals uh, 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 there. I know you're shocked. Uh, uh, there, uh, our Greg Gar is uh, 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 there, and he was Solicitor General under Bush, uh, and so, uh, uh, and Paul Clements to the left was another Solicitor General. So they brought in big guns uh, uh, to do that. By the way, there's a whole statistical survey right now that shows that these people who are the Supreme Court practitioners are actually statistically more likely to get their cert petitions granted. 
uh, um, because they know how to write them and because people know them uh, out there. But that's it. Those are the two that are going to argue on either side. Uh, one you know, representing, Paul's representing uh, uh, the company. Uh, Greg is representing the state. So what's it all about? When the original colonies of the United States came into the Union, uh, um, the question is, what did they own for water? And what the determination was that if you, in fact, could navigate over the course of the river, the whole river, then the river banks and the bottom of it belonged to the states. If not, they went into private ownership. Um, so that was the true of the original states, and then something called the equal footing doctrine, true for Tennessee too, means that every state that came in after uh, uh, that, you know, original 13 states, came in with the same issue, and that is, if in fact when you came into the Union, you could navigate your, that water, then the banks and beds uh, uh, belong to you. So that becomes the question. That becomes the question right now uh, for Montana, and that is, at the time that Montana came into the Union, you know, were these waterways, there's actually three rivers, uh, I'll show you up here, uh, up there, you can see them coming through Montana. Uh, this is one part of one river, which becomes relevant in a second, uh, 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 there. So the question is, you know, who, who owns it? And you have, in order to decide that, you have to actually decide navigability. Now, you can't be surprised. Uh, that the first court and then the Montana Supreme Court would find in favor of? This, this is not complicated, you know, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Uh, the state, of course, you know, they're all state. Uh, they didn't actually even work hard uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, do that, in part because they said, well, we, you know, who knows what happened really uh, at the beginning uh, 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 there, but it, you can navigate some of them now, except for brief interruptions. You can navigate them except for brief interruptions. This is their idea of a brief interruption. Uh, uh, and, and there's a, a funny part of the opinion doing with portages. I mean, I, I actually love to kayak. I, for me, I don't know about you all, a long portage for me would be quarter mile, maybe a half mile, you know, portaging mean you're going around some obstruction. And, and I could see that would be brief. This one is 17 miles. Uh, <laughs> they found that. And I'm thinking, I'm not portaging my kayak 17 miles. I don't know about you. Uh, and they also said uh, that we, it, it, you know, we don't have to look at stream segments. Uh, uh, we actually have to look at just the stream as a whole. And so if there's brief interruptions, that's OK. Uh, that's what's before uh, uh, the Supreme Court uh, 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 right now. I, I will just be. I, I don't hardly ever predict these sorts of things, but I'll be amazed if at the end of it, this is what, what the uh, uh, brief by the Department of Justice that they filed, uh, which was an amicus brief because they're not in the case, said, remand it back to the state, make the state find out what, what was navigability at the time uh, that they came into the union, not now, and do it stream segment by stream segment. Don't do these whole things where you actually just carve out 17 mile stretches. I'll be really surprised if they uh, uh, do not do that. In, here in the last minute, I'm only gonna do three or four cases where cert was denied. Now remember, you know, four, four justices have to vote. Uh, these are significant environmental cases. Uh, where that came before the Supreme Court, uh, and they, at one stage or another in the last three weeks uh, or four weeks, have denied cert. Uh, I think everybody has to be a little careful to put too much weight on that cert denial because it could be for any reason at all. But there's actually some very interesting, some significant, and I'm going to do these quickly uh, uh, because they were out. This is another Ninth Circuit uh, uh, case, Pacific Merchant Shipping, uh, is the effort by California uh, to regulate vessels that are offshore. So these are not just vessels that are California vessels, these are foreign flag vessels, any uh, uh, vessels uh, uh, that uh, uh, came in. Uh, it got challenged. Uh, the, you know, California said they could still do it, uh, and uh, the Supreme Court uh, denied cert. This is the home builder's case in San Joaquin Valley, and it deals with whether or not, in, uh, San, in California, unlike 
uh, uh, Tennessee actually divides up their state and each one of these little districts are separate and they can have their own rules about how they do it. San Joaquin Valley being a huge agricultural area, they develop their own rule under the Clean Air Act uh, and the National Association of Home Builders said, I believe it's preempted by the Clean Air Act. Now remember, that was kind of the discussion we had in the AEP. Uh, the Ninth Circuit said, no, it's not. It's not preempted, cert denied. Ah, Morrison versus Dravo is a Superfund uh, 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 case. There's been a whole trilogy of Superfund cases uh, decided in the last 10 years, most of them by Justice Thomas. Uh, one of the open issues was who can sue and how do they sue? Uh, so Morrison is cleaning up the property uh, uh, and clearly it's property that they were in fact uh, uh, responsible for as well. Uh, they go to the state and they do a consent decree with the state uh, to get that cleanup and they're doing it, they're performing it, but they believe that Dravo contributed to all that. So they sue them. They sue Dravo, and the whole issue is, how do you sue them? Do you sue them under what is called Section 107 of Superfund, which is kind of more innocence, or, or Section 113, which is contribution? Uh, uh, that's the whole issue, is how do you sue them? They pick the first one, because it gives them better rights. Uh, uh, the court said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can only go under, this case, 113, which is the contribution case, sir, denied uh, on uh, that in the practice Superfund, actually uh, um, more important than you uh, would think. And then here is the one that just came out more recently. It's actually fascinating uh, uh, because uh, it's an Endangered Species Act issue. At the heart of it is an Endangered uh, uh, Species Act issue. There has been for any number of uh, years in the uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, 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 jurisprudence, this whole question of where is the Commerce Clause, what's a dormant Commerce Clause, what's the authority of the Commerce Clause uh, to regulate, and it's particularly true uh, in environmental statutes. It happens more there where those things come up than in most other cases uh, uh, there. And it's certainly true under wetland jurisdiction. There's been a lot of challenges uh, to EPA and the Corps of Engineers wetland jurisdiction under Commerce Clause issues. So too, the Endangered Species Act. Uh, uh, there have been a number of challenges saying that this is beyond the authority uh, uh, of the Congress to uh, uh, regulate or legislate in this area. It's not there, and none of those cases have ever gone to the Supreme Court, but they've all been upheld. This one, more complicated. Over there on the right is a so-called Delta smelt. Uh, uh, it is just a little fish uh, uh, there, and it's endangered. And it only exists in California. It doesn't exist anywhere else. And so in California, they're not the only place, but they're probably, along with the Pacific Northwest, having enormous fight, enormous, uh, uh, and it deals with the interchange of water quantity issues, like you saw in the Yellowstone River argument, water quantity issues, uh, uh, biological diversity, by that I mean ESA, and agricultural issues, all of them, because there's not enough water. Uh, and so which of those trump in any particular uh, case? The ESA, we know from TVA versus Hill and other statutes, is a very, very, very strong statute when it applies. Uh, and so the biological opinions that come out of the Department of Interior uh, and uh, Department of Commerce, uh, NIMPS, are very important, those biological opinions, and sometimes they trump. But what happens if, in fact, uh, the Delta smelt, which is at the heart of some of this controversy, is only in the state, uh, uh, do, what does that mean for Commerce Clause issues? And so n there's a lot written about this. There's a lot of a huge challenge about that. That's the whole issue. Cert denied. Uh, so you know, what do we know about it? We know that the Supreme Court was not willing to take that case up uh, 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 right now. That's about all we know uh, 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 there. Uh, but it would have, it, it absolutely would have been fascinating. All right. So what I've done, uh, I just did two cases that we did last term. I did w one water. You know, one greenhouse gas. I want to say just a second about that, uh, greenhouse gas in a minute in terms of current events, and then two this term, and then three or four that they have denied. By the way, there will be others. You know, the Supreme Court takes cases on a rolling basis, so we expect that there will be others that they will grant uh, cert on. Those. So those are clearly the most important. Last point I want to make, and then I'll see if you have any questions, uh, is in fact current events, and that is I told you about greenhouse gas. Remember, I told you that the world changed 
uh, be, uh, while that AEP decision was going on. Remember I told you when they filed that thing in 2004 and when the 2007 came up, there really wasn't any EPA regulations, nothing uh, out there. There are now. Uh, what they have is the so-called endangerment finding, and that comes directly out of Massachusetts versus EPA, where EPA says, in fact, greenhouse gases are dangerous. Uh, 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 second, uh, there is something called the car rule, which actually gives you miles per gallon standards. Uh, it's how we have the no, this, this next variety, this next era now of well, what they call cafe standards comes out of that. And then third, something called a tailoring rule, which is stationary sources, you know, huge areas emitting greenhouse gases, which are going to have to get permits if they modify that. Those are the rules that are coming up. Interesting. Follow this, and that is, uh, it's already been set in February of next year, D.C. Circuit. All of them argued together, same panel, two days, back to back. By the way, this is a lot of work uh, uh, for the justices uh, of uh, uh, that. And so, because you're putting those together, uh, whatever comes out of that two-day set of arguments will clearly, in greenhouse gas, be the most important thing that, come up, that has happened since uh, uh, Massachusetts versus EPA. So that's not related to the Supreme Court, although probably some of them will eventually go to the Supreme Court, uh, but I just want to give you current events. Okay, that's it. Uh, uh, any questions that you might have on Supreme Court now, Supreme, Supreme Court last uh, 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 term? I'll start things if no one else Okay. So uh, it's fascinating that, that Justices Scalia and Thomas sort of put a little placeholder in about mass EPA. Is there any reason to think that they think they have a five votes at this point for a different outcome if that were to come back? Or what do you think is possible? I mean, there's two parts that's interesting uh, about that. First of all, that they did it. Uh, because you didn't need to. If, you know, any time you're making these decisions with your accord, of course you're assuming that the underlying uh, decision is still valid. So obviously they meant it to have some impact. Um, but what's also interesting is who didn't sign it. Uh, because uh, uh, Massachusetts versus EPA was a 5-4 decision. And so, in addition to those uh, uh, two, you obviously had, you know, among other people, the Chief Justice. Uh, so Chief Justice Roberts did not s sign that. So what does that mean? Uh, the best that we can figure out is that they're sending a very strong signal uh, that at least two of them is we don't like Massachusetts versus EPA. We specifically don't like the standing and we don't want any assumption made that we've changed our mind. Uh, uh, we in fact uh, feel very strongly again that that decision was uh, uh, improperly decided. Um, by the way, Chief Judge Roberts writing uh, 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 in Massachusetts versus EPA starts his opinion out, right? He finds there's no standing. He says no standing by the states. But he starts it out saying, I realize this might be the most important case, uh, uh, you know, to come before the Supreme Court. I realize just how important this is, but nonetheless, I don't find standing. Uh, uh, so Roberts has always been very careful uh, 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 about that. But it is interesting. It's just interesting uh, that, you know, they put down that placeholder uh, 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 there. Please. Uh, should Congress remove EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gases and the federal common law claim kind of comes back? Would Ginsburg, uh, would her guidepost language then become valuable? And if so, kind of what is the content of that language and how would that determine that? Yeah, and it's, it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, because, again, there were so many procedural issues that did not get handled. And, of course, Sotomayor was not in that opinion. So her role would also then become quite significant as well. Uh, so all of that is true. This much is, though, is absolutely, I think, correct, and I think it's your question, that is. So if, in fact, this is all based on, uh, uh, which makes sort of sense, uh, that if Congress has already legislated in the Clean Air Act and they've done everything that you need to do, then why would there be a federal common law? Right, you know, that's, you know, and that's the displacement in, in a nutshell uh, 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 there. But what if Congress changed their mind? What if they didn't do that? At a minimum, at an absolute minimum, and that is that decision no longer dictates. Uh, so you start out. And, and there you might be right, notwithstanding what I told you about my wife giving directions where she said, you know, don't, don't turn on the Walmart. And it's probably dicta. It's very important dicta. Uh, because her dicta in that case, her guidepost, uh, says that there is a new federal common law and environment is very much involved in that. Uh, uh, and that's a very significant role and, and 
when, when Alito, Alito and Thomas wrote their concurring opinion, they did not attack that. They did not say anything wrong with that. Now, they would all say it's dicta. Uh, but, so, but under those circumstances, it becomes important for that issue. But it also becomes important on unrelated cases, cases that are not greenhouse gas, that we're actually trying to figure out what's the, you know, what's the contours of federal common law today. Without question, uh, she is endorsing this new common law approach, which is quite interesting. So we probably have time for one last question before we let Please. Us. You know, Rapanos, you know, was like, from my idea, of judicial malpractice. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you want to see uh, uh, judges that give, however, whatever side you're on. I mean, I'm an environmentalist, so I want to see a robust approach uh, to well, wetlands because they're in so whole important. If there's anything we saw out of Katrina and out of the Deepwater Horizon, we saw how important wetlands are. But that said, you want their process to work, and it's not working right now uh, 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 there. But there have been, I, I think, six different cert requests, including one criminal case to the Supreme Court, and they've denied every single one of them. Uh, uh, there is guidance documents out right now that they're going through notice and comment are. Frankly, my own personal view on that is the guidance documents are not good enough. You need rulemaking in order to do that. But even rulemaking is challenging uh, uh, in the, uh, be just because of the status of uh, that case. But that would be the answer. The answer would be either they take a case and clean it up uh, or the legisl legislature clean it up or EPA does a rule because I don't think the status quo is any good right now. But I really enjoyed talking to you. This has been fun uh, about that. I'll stay up here afterwards for a little You guys probably have to go to class. I don't. Uh, uh, and so uh, I'll get a chance to see uh, uh, any of you that need to afterwards. Michael? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.